What's happening, guys, and welcome to our weekly Impact Wrestling Review. Today we're going to take a look at the February 22nd edition of Impact, the fallout from Uncaged, the first set of tapings from Las Vegas. I'm Keith, and I am joined by Mr. Impact on YouTube. Ro, what's going on? Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Since that is the only way you are able to view Impact these days, I guess we'll uh, we'll call you the self-proclaimed Mr. Impact on YouTube. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know what, though, I feel for the most part outside of maybe some of the uh, backstage promos or angles, like I kind of get a good idea of the show. I mean, obviously, somebody I'm pretty sure would argue otherwise, like, you know, you didn't see the whole thing. So you don't know what you did. You saw like but yeah, yeah, yeah. YouTube and, you know, whatever they share on Twitter does a great job of uh, keeping me up to date. So that's always good. Yeah. And it's good to have that option that at least if you are unable to catch it on Twitch, you do have it on YouTube for most of the um, stuff. But uh, overall, I, th I thought it was a, uh, a pretty good show. I, uh, you know, I was a little down when I read the uh, spoilers. I mean, this is the first time that I've really read them, but I was kind of very interested to see where they were going. And they, uh, they surprised me with the show. I think they really filled in the blanks that the spoilers don't give you. So I, like I said, I think they turned it into a good show. What did you think? Yeah, I agree. Um, I think the one thing with spoilers, and I know everybody's, you know, has different opinions of them because I too look at spoilers, but it's kind of more so to get an idea. A lot of times, what's reported and what's what actually happens sometimes obviously is different. And like you said, spoilers, you don't get every single detail that happens. And, you know, the biggest thing I always think about is some years back, I remember spoilers had um, when Josh Barnett was a part of the company, they had him defeating uh, Lashley for the world championship. Mm -hmm. And obviously we didn't get to see that. So it's, that's kind of one of those things. I don't know if they scrapped it or whatever, but that's kind of one of the things sometimes like spoilers, like while they tell you certain things, it doesn't tell you everything entirely. As for the show, you know, I thought it was I thought it could have been flawless, but there were some things like I felt like, man, this was awesome. And then I'm like, man, this was stupid. And I'm sure we'll get into it. And mm -hmm. I don't I don't want to sit and act like some snob, like, oh, you know, everything has to be a perfect 10. But it's just like some things like, you know, they had a good flow. And I just felt like then there that one thing it kind of stuck out a little bit. But let's uh, get into it. All right. So we open the show with the current champion, Johnny Impact. He comes out, says he's been a fighting champion. He beat all th beat three men at Uncaged, and he can now close that chapter. He's looking to move on to the next contender. This brings out Moose. He calls Johnny a crybaby and the worst champion Impact Wrestling has had. He blames Killer Cross and Cage for him not winning the title. Cross then comes out. He gets a great reaction. He's, I guess, the hometown hero in Vegas, so to speak. Um, Cross starts running down Moose. He says that Moose is taxing on Killer Cross's patience. Then he calls Moose's alpha stupid. This leads to a great back and forth between the two men. Um, Johnny starts adding fuel to the fire, and he says, let's have a match. The winner of this gets to be number one contender. I thought they opened pretty strong with a good segment, and that led to a, a good match between the two of them. I like this. Um, you have, um, I almost called this man Johnny Cage, <laughs> Johnny Impact coming out. And, you know, he's ready to move on and take on another, a new challenger. And that's normally something that you get from your face. I mean, I know, you know, there's a, part of a group of people who probably believe it's time for him to turn heel he's stale and I, I get it but this is what you want from a face he's looking for a new challenge and what what i liked about this is you know moose did point out killer cross's two failed attempts at uh unsuccessfully uh, obtaining the world title mm -hmm. so moose feels like he it's his time and that was a matchup that i think we had talked about like you know, that's something I'm interested in seeing a one-on-one -on -one between right. Johnny and Moose. So I liked this. I mean, it was weird for me seeing Killer Cross kind of like bicker back and forth with Moose because I feel like he's always so kind of, um, you know, with with his promos, it's just like real. He's real. Is real. Uh, um, I ain't got the word. I apologize. But, you know, he kind of just takes his time and kind of pauses a little bit. So yeah. to see him bicker, bicker back and forth, it kind of threw me off. But I liked this, though. I think that just led to his frustration with Moose. I mean, Moose is kind of, you know, he's so ridiculous with everything. So you could see how 
he would get to this point where it's not like his normal promo and it's just like built up frustration and that's the only way he can kind of express it. Yeah, and, you know, the one funny part is when you when you hear Moose, he's like, yeah, who I thought was my best friend. <laughs> I'm all thinking to myself, uh, you know, you thought Eddie was your best friend too. You, right. yes, you haven't learned yet. No, nope. yeah, I liked this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it was good. And that led to the number one contendership match between Moose and Cross. We had Johnny Impact on commentary. I loved one point in the match when both of them hit each other with a low blow behind the ref's back. And then they start complaining to each other about low blowing each other. Um, action goes to the outside. Uh, Cross picks up a, a cup of coffee that was on the commentator's desk. He throws it in Johnny's face. Moose goes to hit Cross with a pump kick. Cross moves out of the way. He nails Johnny. Johnny gets pissed, goes in the ring, starts attacking both men, and the match gets thrown out. And that's, I think, the right decision. I mean, we did see some tension between Moose and Cross leading up to this, but I think there's a much bigger story to play here and a bigger match that they can have. So I think going to a no contest was the right right call here. You know, it would look like until we, we, we saw what happened next, it looked like a nice way to set up a potential three-way dance for the mm-hmm. Impact World Championship. I'm oh, just yeah. saying if that if that was the route. Because, you know, then, obviously what, what happened, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I said you open your mouth and then someone gets shoved in it and here he comes. Here you know. Comes, oh, no, go ahead. No, go ahead. Fit it, fit no, it. no, I was just going to say Brian Cage comes out for the save. He picks up the title and then hands it to Johnny and they all leave. I didn't like how everybody just kind of left the ring. Like you, you just see Cross and Moose standing outside and Cage is walking through the ropes and they're kind of like, oh, I guess we should get out of here. He just wasn't needed for the segment. It, hmm. it really just doesn't make any sense because, <clears throat> excuse me, Johnny's talked about moving on and I get cages gripe about not getting his fair one-on-one match but hey you know you got had opportunities and you didn't capitalize on them you know you have a number one contenders match it gets thrown out why is cage out there saving johnny shouldn't he have a bone to pick with johnny because he feels like he's been screwed so he's essentially helping johnny why i don't know all right so well well i was gonna say while we're on this point i'll let you finish first but we'll go right to the backstage segment that took place a little later on no, that was all I wanted to add. It was just like it just doesn't make any it doesn't make any sense. Like I understand having a bone to pick with Johnny, mm-hmm. but you know you gotta f- fall to the back of the line. You know, I, I guess if anything, he should be upset. Like, hey, I want to be a part of a number one's contenders match, and and you know they do something like that. But okay, go ahead and go to the backstage. Yeah, yeah so we about. have J- Cage and Johnny backstage. Johnny thanks Cage for the help. Johnny says that he wants to give Cage a title shot, but there's no way they're going to get a one-on-one match with Moose and Cross. Uh, Johnny says he wants them to tag to then take them out, and then he will give Cage a title shot. And then Cage says he doesn't trust him. Like you said, had they, Johnny could have went back there and could have been like, "Oh, what happened? You didn't come out there." And that's when Cage could have said, "I don't trust you. Every time you've screwed me, or something like that." And then. We get Johnny presenting him with a contract that says that he's signed already, and then if Cage signs it, he'll get a title shot anytime he wants. You know, it seems like the route they want to go is their friends. You know, it's just gotten heated, and then that's when, excuse me, if they're going to do the hill turn, they'll do the hill turn. I just thought this was poor writing because you've booked Cage to be this guy who feels like he's been screwed, and you could argue, but to see him kind of all mucking it up backstage with Johnny, like, hey, okay, all right, you know, like that, it just doesn't make any sense. It really doesn't make any sense. And I just thought what they had and then to do this, you know, this was just, (laughs) it was kind of dumb in my opinion. Fair enough. Fair enough. We are each allowed to have our own opinions, so. (laughs) <laughs> are you sure about that <laughs> uh, all right in this case absolutely i fully support anyone's opinion as long as they argue their case that's all i ask uh, and then we learn that don Callis has hired glenn gilberti everybody's favorite um and then we go backstage lax is there conan hypes lax to go out there get that rematch and this is it this is the last time or so we think or so we think they're funny with their rematch clauses man i swear it's so inconsistent and i know Mm -hmm. there's a population of people who believe nah you know we we don't like it you know just move on and out okay but if that's going to be the case you need to be consistent with it but we see certain individuals Mm -hmm. i mean 
It goes back and <laughs> forth, back and forth, back and forth. Yeah, and it, it comes up a little later on as well. Um, but, yeah, no, it, it's true. I mean, I'm not the biggest fan of the rematch when, you know, you you have a title change. Your champion or former champion already took a loss, and then he's going to take another loss again, and it's just, I don't know. But I guess that makes the new champion look good, so mm-hmm. I guess, you know, it's it's all about perception, which pretty much is pro wrestling in a nutshell. All right. So this has been some of the bigger news this week. We get a United We Stand promo. Now, this was originally announced as a Twitch show. However, it has been moved to Fight TV. This is going to be a $20 pay-per-view. This takes place, I think, what, the first week of April, I believe? Yes, I think the fourth. um, If I don't have the calendar in front of me. Yeah, so $20 here and then $40 for the Rebellion pay-per-view a couple weeks later. So uh, that's going to be tough, I think, for some people to sling 60 bucks for two shows during the month of April. And then I'm sure most people catch WrestleMania as well, so that's another added thing. But that's here nor there. All right, so let's run down this card so far of the matches we've gotten. We've got the Lucha Brothers versus Sabu and RVD. Um Cage, Moose, Edwards, and Johnny Impact versus Drago, Daga, Aerostar, and King Cuerno. So this is advertised as an Impact versus Lucha Underground match. So uh, we were talking about, I think this was last week, yeah, at Uncaged, how we had uh, Impact versus AAA, and the car, the the teams were seemingly stacked on one side. Now, this, this just looks like not even close in terms of... Uh, I guess your stars. You know, a commenter pointed out uh, last week. I guess one of the wrestlers, I think, was it Psycho Clown? Yeah, or I forgot. Mm-hmm. He was saying that the way that he was positioned, that he worked the main event. Now I don't know if he's a main event stay, but I think I guess the point that I was just trying to make is, you know, you look at who we're putting on Team Impact, and those guys, you know, main eventers for for well, uh, yeah, even Moose, you know, main eventers. Like that's who Impact should be going against. Like I said, I don't know the, those guys. King Corno, that's not, isn't that a? That's, fan, that's not fantastic. fantastic. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I mean that you know he's worked in Impact before, and I think he's a big deal out there. But that was just my main thing. You know, if we're sending our best, we should be facing their best. And if that's their best, then hey, cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's it's an interesting uh, matchup, um, but it's more of a gimmick match just for the show. Uh, so then, Eli Drake versus Tessa Blanchard, special intergender match. Uh, they were announced as being both former champions. Uh, e- Eli Drake had posted an interesting tweet when this news came out saying that he will not participate in a one-on-one intergender match. And uh, we all pretty much have our own feelings on intergender wrestling, and we're not here to discuss that but um very interesting to see if he was just trolling everybody or this is actually going to play a much bigger role and the only reason i bring that up is because originally this was a house of glory impact wrestling show and then it was moved from new york to new jersey and i think the impact wrestlers only found out about this through twitter wasn't was that the case I don't know if this was the one, but I remember it was something similar. I'm pretty like like. Sh- sure this was the one because this was when we saw um, Sanjay leave the company and people had said that he was the guy kind of conveying the messages between management and the performers. So, you know, I, I don't know if this was the way that Eli found out about it and he was kind of annoyed that it wasn't, you know, run by him first. You know, my my only take on it is I feel like both deserve better. Like, first off, I think Eli gains nothing from this match. Oh, nobody does. Yeah, no, and neither does Tessa. Like, you know, the one thing that I say with Tessa especially, and I even say this with the few that I think we're going to probably get between her and Gail Kim, like, her beating Eli, her beating Gail Kim— it doesn't change, and I, I think, you know, you can find a lot of people, it's not going to change their perception of Tessa as being one of the, you know, greatest women wrestlers that are wrestling right now, you know, top five, top three, whatever. So, it, it, it I just feel like it doesn't mean anything. Like, mm-hmm. the only thing I would just say is if they were doing a match like this, 
I it, like because you know I, I've shared my opinion on intergender wrestling. If there's some type of stipulation where the winner gets a future title shot, at least then you know it's like okay, we could see why. And then if you really wanted to throw a twist just out of this world, is the winner gets a future title shot, a uh, world title shot. Mm-hmm. So then you know you're looking at well, dang, if Tessa oh, if Tessa boy. were to win, you know Tessa wins, you know she has a chance at competing for the Impact World Title. I'm just saying something like that to kind of just to bring in some intrigue into the match, right? And it would be something out of the you know the safe playing field that they've kind of been on. Yeah, it just, but, but I just kind of just feel, and you know, the both are tremendous talents. I mean, you could argue if the, they should be the face of the company, you know, mm-hmm. respective faces of the company, but it just, I don't think, you know, especially Eli doesn't benefit nothing from this match and Tessa doesn't need it either. She doesn't need to prove herself by beating a guy. Mm-hmm. No, I agree. I agree. It's, uh, it's just interesting. Uh, how it's come about but uh we'll see how that progresses as we are over a month away from that and then we have the ultimate x match and so far the competitors announced are jake chris jack evans and Cotto brazil so jack evans i guess representing triple a and Cotto brazil uh from mlw so should be interesting it does look like it's going to be a good show it will be very interesting to see how sabu and rvd are uh in 2019 but uh we will see because there will be more matches announced. Then we had the GWN segment. And then we had Rose's favorite segment of the night, the Rascals segment. I must say, I did enjoy this. I think they did a good job here. They utilized it to build a couple of future matches. And, well, one coming up a little later on. Um, Trey says he did what he said he was going to do in Mexico. And that's get a uh, win over Ethan Page. Then Wentz says... Anything you can do, I can do better. And he says next week he will beat Ethan Page. And that match we already know was set up. And then Trey says, how about I team with Dez and we take on the Desi Hit Squad? Then we see Gama Singh show up. He sits down and says, this is how you guys prepare to take on the Desi Hit Squad. Then he pulls out a hookah. He says, this is the real stuff. They all give it a shot. Ten minutes later, we see all of them out of it, drooling on themselves, and Gama is still going. Like, like I said, I got a kick out of the segment. I think they did it, They utilized it to at least build on. You know, I obviously I didn't catch this on YouTube, but uh, yeah, that does sound a little bit interesting and funny, I should say. Yeah, yeah. No, no, they did a good job, and um, you know, I think they they need to utilize some things a little better like this, and they did here. Um, then we get a Reno Scum hype video. They return next week, so at least they did a little something there. Um, and then we got that match, the Rascals versus the Desi Hit Squad. Uh, Gama Singh comes out to obviously announce his team. So I had read during the tapings that he had, you know, did a little heel promo beforehand, running down Vegas and whatnot. Um, they didn't add this part on TV, so I don't know why they don't do that to build at least some heat on the Desi Hit Squad, unless they're already supposed to have that heat on them, and that's not necessary, just used in front of the live crowd. You know, I'm guessing it probably didn't go over, it wouldn't go over on TV as well as they would want. That's yeah. my only suggestion. No, that's that's a fair point, yeah. Um, but, uh, alright, so yeah, we had that match, um, the Rascals did come out originally start, you know, selling what had happened backstage. So I like that they included that. Um, the hit squad went on the uh, advantage early on. Uh, the crowd was super behind the Rascals. Um, Trey was busy showboating for the crowd when Dez went to go make a tag. Then he ends up slapping Trey, finally tagging himself in. They go back and forth, both teams. The Rascals end up hitting a double 6-1-9, and then Trey hits the double knees for the victory. Um, I think the hit squad should have picked up this victory here. You know, the one thing I was thinking, all of the Rascals' wins, they've all come from, from the Desi hit squad, haven't they? Um, have they beaten anybody else? Probably not. I really think in, you know, I'm sure somebody will point it out to me because I was trying to think maybe, maybe OVE. I don't know if OVE, uh, the Chris brothers have faced them. I don't think but, they have yet. Okay. So I think all their wins have come from the Desi Hit squad. You know, this is a, the thing that just kind of just, it's always been a concern of, of mine. And I mean, obviously I get, you know, we see where the, where the roster is like, 
in order for them to build someone, they got to end up since the roster is so thin in certain so many um divisions, it hurts the other teams. Like you know, we don't have no solid hill tag team. You know, outside of OVE, you know, right. and and you know, you look at how they've been used. Like I thought, Desi Hit Squad, they were fun. You know, good in their roles. You know, and you gotta give them a win every now and then, man. Right. I mean, like I feel like. And, and that's probably the thing, you know, like you were pointing out for Gama to come out to draw heat on them. I think people the people look at them as just, you know, they're just a, a jobber team, really. Yeah. You know, that's, that, that that's all that, that's all they are because they don't win. They don't they don't win on explosion. They don't win on impact. They don't win. And mm-hmm. it's it's a shame. You know, whether you think they're capable of being tag team champions, that's here nor there, but you gotta give them something. And it's just I mean, like I said, I'd probably have to go back and look, but I think every win that the Rascals, the only wins that the Rascals have had as a team were against the Desi Hit Squad. Yeah, because I think right after Homecoming, they were fed to the Lucha Brothers the next night, and that was that was it. And then it was them versus the Rascal. I mean, them versus the Hit Squad every other match. Yeah, it just doesn't. And, you know, what threw me off, too, is uh, I didn't even realize till after the fact I'm watching. I'm like, wait a minute, Trey's wrestling? Because, you know, I got so accustomed to Wentz. Mm-hmm. But then, like you said, Wentz had announced he's going to challenge Ethan Page, which that's another thing one I worry about. But uh, we'll get to that when uh, we have ne- that match. Yeah, <laughs> next week, uh, the new Mr. Impact Wrestling. Oh, boy. All right, so we get uh, Melissa Santos backstage. She interviews Eli Drake. She says that he cost Team Impact the match last week. Eli says, the book of Eli says when you sin against him, he will come down on you. So I guess that was when Eddie, I think, put his hands on him earlier in the match. Eli says tonight he is going to show him the way and how hardcore makes him an absolute loser. Obviously talking about Eddie Edwards. And I thought they went with a good story during the match, which we will get to in a little while. Um, then we see Rich Swan. He is laid up in a hospital bed. We see Sal- Sammy Callahan enter. Sammy says he's sorry. He did what he did, not because he hates him, but because he loves him. He says he's proud that Rich stood up to him. Doctor comes in. She tries to escort Sammy out, saying this is for family only. Rich Swan then stops her and says he is family. Sammy then grabs an OVE shirt, puts it on Rich Swan, and leaves. I, I thought this was a l- good little segment. Kind yeah, of. both, 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 both were especially like that promo that Eli cut, and I mean fandom aside, because I'm a big Eli Drake fan. That was some excellent stuff, and I just said that was, that was solid. And uh, even the um, Sammy Callahan, like I don't know why I forgot. I'm like, what's Rich Swan doing in the hospital? What, <laughs> like, what did I miss? And then I had to remember what uh, took place last week. So yeah. you know, two back to back, you know, good angles that are um, progressing storyline wise. Right. And that's what they're meant to do, and they did their job, and that's really all we can ask, you know? Mm -hmm. All right, so then we had Eli Drake versus Eddie Edwards. All right, so I have a question for you or all of our listeners out there. When is the last time Eli Drake main evented an Impact show? I'm thinking when he cashed in his briefcase for that title shot against Pentagon. Now I'm thinking about it. I don't even know if that main evented the show. (sighs) Whoa. Now I come to think of it, if I had to guess, and this might be me reaching, it had to be right when Don and company got on board. Or like, was right, it when he got his rematch for the title? When he dropped it to Aries on their debut episode. But then remember he didn't he got the briefcase and then I think he the, he took from Moose. And I think that one had main evented. I forgot. But mm. I think Aerie, was Aries still champion then? I think Aries was still champion. No, yeah. Pentagon. Okay, there you go. Yeah. It was uh, when Pentagon was a uh, world champion and defended against Eli. That's, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, that's what, what 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 I'm thinking too. You know, it's I I mean, we'll never know. You know, I know some people, you know, might not see Eli in that light. Like you said, you know, everyone has different opinion, and that's always great. But I really felt like this match, for me, this was match of the night by far. Oh, yeah, this should have been the main event. But I was like, man, and I know titles aren't everything, but could you imagine if this was some title feud, these two? You know, one of them champion and, and you know, the other one challenging. Like, they, they've had some great chemistry. And it made me want more. And I'm all saying to myself, even the outcome of the match, how it ended, because, you know, it wasn't that that Eli ate a finisher or anything like that. It was completely story driven. 
yeah, and it made me want to see more. And I'm like, man, I hope these guys face ag- mm-hmm. face again. I think sometimes when you're gonna have some of these feuds that you drag out, you have to do something that's gonna make people want to see more. I don't think people, or at least I'll just you know speak on behalf of myself. You don't want to see somebody who keeps losing, like literally coming up short. You know. I keep eating pins, you know, not by luck, but literally eating pins and then challenging again and again and again and again. And like, that's the stuff that gets tiresome. Mm -hmm. But, but, and this has been like an organic build. And I think that's the thing that people can appreciate. Right. And I mean, you know, it fits the bill with Eli's character or what it has become at this point. And that's why it works. Yeah, and even too, you know, you got to give Eli, uh, Eli um, Eddie some credit as well. He's really found himself as a different character, and mm-hmm. I think, you know, we didn't touch on it last week, but him re-signing with the company, like, you know, I hope they do good by him. I think he would be the perfect guy if you were trying to, you know, build somebody up for the main event. Like, I'd have him thrusted in the main event title picture, and he could be that guy that can work with, you know, the talent that they you know, have high hopes for. Right. And he's, he's a good hand. Cause I think the one thing with Eddie, what he has going against him is a lot of his success was before they became impact wrestling. So when you look at when they, when they're billing him, you know, former world champion, X division champion, et cetera, that was under the TNA, TNA umbrella. Eddie, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's good to know. I do have a question. Is Eddie trying to grow a mullet? I don't know what that was. <laughs> Um, but you know, he just changing up his look, but, uh, uh, like I said, you know, it's, it's good for him. And I think this feud, you know, it shows a lot, you know, a lot with Eddie because, you know, in the, in the past too, you know, they were looking at, you know, he was kind of dubbed by some as a vanilla, vanilla Baby midget face. or what? Yep. Yeah, or whatever that that term that people people use. So you know, he's shown some character development and stuff. So that's yeah. always fascinating. And, and just the fact that he's you know technically unstable in his character that kind of throws a wrench in the works, and you really don't know what he's capable of. Like when him and Aries had that feud uh, last year, they they could have really you know made something out of it, and then it just fizzled out. Yeah, he's an he's a guy that I think where he works when we're talking about. You know, because, you know, he's, I'm pretty sure he's a face like we're talking about when you have some of these these champions, he's someone like maybe have him be the first challenger mm. until you got that challenger ready where you're. that's going to be the one that probably potentially wins the title off your champion. But he's one like, why haven't we seen him challenge or has he challenged Johnny Impact? I don't think so. Huh? I don't believe so. No. If Johnny's looking for new challenges, he would be the perfect candidate. Maybe have a. a Eli versus Johnny Impact number one contendership match, mm. you know, but I doubt it. But there's yeah. an idea. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Um, so yeah, we, we get this match. It was good, like we had said. Um, Eddie puts Eli crotch first into the turnbuckle on the out- or the ring post on the outside. Uh, Eddie gets a bunch of near falls, so he has resorted to going outside the ring to grab Kenny. He gets distracted. Eli hits a burning hammer for a near fall, which apparently I, I think that's a new newer move for his. Uh, move set. I like him using it. Uh, Eli then grabs Kenny. He goes to hit Eddie with it. Eddie ducks, gets a jackknife cover on Eli for the win, and Eli loses because he tries to resort to the hardcore tactics, which if you go back to his promo, he said he was going to prove that hardcore wrestling makes you look like a loser. So they did a good job. Yes. Kudos to Impact on that. Yep, absolutely. Uh, so we go backstage, and Tessa is yelling in imp- into Impact's management's office, saying that she should be the knockout champion, and then asking about a rematch. Uh, she's then caught up by Rolando Melendez, who is apparently the investigative reporter. I think we saw him once before in Mexico. He asks Tessa what happened. She says Impact management won't give her her rematch. They only care about one thing, and that's protecting management, a.k.a. Gail Kim, she says she's going to get her rematch one way or another. So there's that. And that will progress a little later on. We'll finish touching up upon that when we see her once again. Uh, Then we see Glenn Gilberti backstage, and he's looking for impact management. Uh, One of the guys backstage gives him directions. He forgets them, and he ends up walking through a door that leads him outside the arena. So that's fine for Disco. Probably where he belongs. Um, (laughs) (laughs) 
Uh, I mean, I think that's probably the role that he's going to play. He's just going to be kind of a stooge, and I think if that's what they're going to utilize him as, that's probably the right call. You know, I just don't see the value. He doesn't have, uh, I mean, I don't know how you feel, but I just feel like his value. A lot of people probably aren't familiar with, you know, what he was, you know, back in his WCW days, which was essentially. 20 years ago. (laughs) Yeah, it was essentially, you know, a lower tier guy. I mean, you know, he had some success. He was a comedy wrestler, basically. TV title, cruiserweight title, but, you know, that name value, it's not. You know, he. I think he'd be best served if he was one of these guys like working as an agent backstage. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's not somebody that I don't think he should be on T- TV. I mean, if you're going to have him on commentary, I guess that's not too bad. But I don't know, to be kind of having time, you know, allotted to him where he's getting screen, screen time, you're taking that away from people who have trouble getting on. Yeah. And I think he's a manager during in the Ring Warriors show, or was anyway. I'm not sure if that's still going on. But yeah, he managed a tag team in that as well. Uh, so we have Alicia Edwards versus Delilah Doom. Match goes on for a few minutes. Tessa comes out, interview, interferes. This throws the match out. She beats up Alicia. She press slams her on the outside. Uh, she has a little back and forth with Delilah. She lays her out with a sit-out powerbomb and eventually the buzzsaw. Um, and then we see backstage Delilah react to what just happened. And she says this was supposed to be her big debut. And then she challenges Tessa to a match next week. Um, I thought, you know, she looked really solid backstage with her promo. And uh, they set up a match for next week. So they did what they, they should have. You know, from I from what I saw in the match, and I know it was mainly just to play up to an angle. And I don't know. Not no stuff happens in the wrestling ring. But... She came across to me, at least, as I'm unfamiliar. I only know her by name, but Delilah Doom, she seemed a little bit sloppy in some parts of this match. And I think about that post-match angle where even, like, for the when uh, Tessa was going to hit the buzzsaw. Mm-hmm, she like, it. Yeah, but they played it off as she was able, unable to get up. Oh, okay. I, yeah. I see. I guess you can do it like that. And like I said, you know, the one thing that I thought they should have done, and I don't know if Delilah Doom is just working these tapings or is she somebody that they're going to bring on board. Not I really sure. thought, I really thought just in the event that if, because like I said, I'm just going to go with the former. I really thought, you know, they could have given us a small little video package of excuse me, who Delilah Doom is for those who aren't familiar with her work. Right. Well, I mean, I, I think she they were doing tryouts i believe before the show so they might not have been prepared to bring her in but i guess mm-hmm. they could have just run a promo this week like they did for reno scum and just had her debut next week or something like that yeah i mean they did it more it looks like they relied more once again on the social media and like i said like you can advertise these people but you know who are they you know right. just give us a little a little a little bit of some some small yeah. backstory or anything but yeah, that was just my little gripe. That's fair. Uh, then we had an Ace Austin promo video. Looks like he is going to be joining the roster soon. I believe, I think they said debut next week, but I'm not completely sure. Um, and then we have the Impact and NFL alumni partnership. And then we go backstage and we see James Mitchell. He meets up with Rosemary, who is standing in the back with Sue Young and Allie. Um, he says that she's trying to take something that isn't hers. He says, let's make a deal. I want you. And he says to bring, you know, the demon assassin back for him. We're not sure who he's talking about. Uh, he says that Rosemary should assemble her team versus his team. And he says if she wins, she gets Allie. If he wins, he gets her. So this is building to a match probably in a couple weeks. I'm sure we'll see more building of that within the coming weeks. But um yeah, it's still interesting to see all three of them just randomly standing backstage. The few that goes on forever, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, I'm, I'm sure we all know the participants that are going to be in this match. Yeah, I mean, I wonder if we'll ever kind of get some some uh, ending to this. I mean, just, man, you know, we got Rosemary back. Now, well, it looks like we got her back now. I'm guessing. That she yeah, I think she, I think she's wrestled on uh, one of the one night onlys or Twitch specials that they had done recently. But I would really like to see this, you know, they do away with this and kind of have these women back in the division competing because Lord knows we're going to need it soon. Gotcha. Yep. 
That is true. And then uh, Melissa interviews Taya, the current knockouts champion. She says that Tessa is throwing a temper tantrum like a child. And what do we do? We're not going to give in to the child. She says she is knockouts champion and she has better things to worry about. What those things are, we are not sure about. That's so funny because what Tessa, <laughs> Tessa, I mean, Tessa, yeah, Tessa only got what one rematch, right? Well, I mean, you know. <laughs> but this goes in with the whole rematch thing like we were talking about. But like that's why I say with consistency. Now, Taya got three opportunities before she got the title. Tessa at, uh, only got one rematch, and it's, God, it's time to move on. Like well, I said, it, it, it's it's funny to me just because, and I feel like that's more what comes with management. They cherry pick this stuff, and I guess that's what, what kind of bothers me. A little bit just because we kind of see like either you're going to do with the rematches or you're not. But that should apply to the challengers, too. You get two shots and then back of the line. But we see with certain individuals who they want and see as the you know future champion, they get just it's unlimited title shots. Well, there's some truth to that. But with the Tessa and Taya thing, they kind of knew this was going to be a long program at Bound for Glory. They did have kind of a screwy finish um, and then then. They had the rematch, which got thrown out when Tessa attacked the referee. And then they had the match at homecoming, which also, well, that that was ridiculous all on its own. But, I mean, last week when Ty and Tessa had the street fight, it was pretty much a clean victory, and that should have really closed the, the story. Like, And, you know, I, and I get it like that because it, it looks like, you know, the whole point of it is they want her to face Gail. But then, too, it's like... There's not even much follow up with that. It's kind of like every other so many weeks we you know we'll hear mention of it or we'll see something. Mm-hmm. I just you know I just like I said my thing is like this. I have no problem with Taya moving on. Who she moves on to, like you said, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. That's the problem. <laughs> but I mean, we'll see. And as we get into you know the main event, like we see though, it's never stopped them before. You know, somebody gets the rematch. It seems like it's the blow off. Then there's some type of angle that leads to, Hey, they're going to get another match. So mm-hmm. there's no and, consistency. Well, that's yeah. That, that's the thing. Like everybody, I mean, you had Ty and Tessa in this feud and then pretty much mostly everyone else was, uh, in the undead realm. And there was no consistency there since they were trading back and forth victories so nobody is really gaining an upper hand in any of that. So, yeah, it, it, it is what it is, mm-hmm. plain and simple. And then we move on to the main event, LAX for the, versus the Lucha Brothers, a match we have never seen before. This is number three. Um, it only took three matches for them to start to build heat on this feud. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's really what came out of this outcome. I really thought I don't know if you wanted to dive into the match, but really the post match is what kind of where I just kind of thought yeah. was silly. Um, well, this match was a little more aggressive than the last two matches. Uh, the one at homecoming and then the rematch. Uh, what was that? Two weeks ago, it seemed like those were just high flying matches between two teams. It was just a competitive match. And then now on match number three, it started to get a little more aggressive. There was a little more fuel added to the fire. And then Lucha brothers end up retaining with a spike package pile driver. Uh, LAX goes to extend their hands. Uh, Lucha brothers get into their faces. LAX then attack and take off the Lucha brothers masks. So now it has become or it's come to this, I guess. Um, so there was a funny moment uh, that stood out to me before um, this that took place when Conan was shaking hands with the Lucha Brothers, and you could clearly see Pentagon start to untie his mask. <laughs> I didn't catch that. Yeah, yeah, he was just starting to like th- see it, and you could see Phoenix start like tugging on his mask to make sure it was easily accessible, so they could do the angle. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't catch that. But let me ask you. So who's the heels in the in this, in your opinion? Uh, well, right now it it seems that they're making LAX to be the heels, but I mean before that there was I didn't think there was really any heels. So just follow me here. Mm-hmm. LAX attacks. Why did LAX attack the Lucha Brothers? Uh, I, I guess because they lost. Okay, well, they they extended their hands, right? Yeah, I, I, I don't have a good explanation for you. 
So we then this was another dumb thing, <laughs> and I compare it. I I compare this to the with the with Johnny and uh, the cage interactions. Okay, you know, in one instance you're claiming you get screwed, but you come and help the guy who you say screwed you, and then you're willing to tag with it. That like, okay, but here we'll focus on this. The thing what I just thought made no sense at all was if they were gonna do the hill turn. Why even do the the extent of the handshake, you know? Or, or if you're gonna do the extent of the handshake, you know, you have the Lucha Brothers, you know, shake their hands, and then that's when LAX makes the tech. Because I'm looking at it like it was kind of like, well, the hell with you, then, you know? Because uh, it, it, I just felt like what Lucha Brothers did was more of a hillish tactic. Because you know, you defeat this team. This team is just kind of just, you know, hey, you know, um, good sportsmanship in a sense, mm. and. You know, the Lucha Brothers essentially is like, man, screw you guys. You know, we beat you guys and stuff. And and then, you know, they even did, uh, you know, Pentagon did what he always does. And he did it to uh, Santana's face. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you see LAX attack. Well, of course, you know, he physically provoked. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I, I guess taking off the mask, is, if that's what you want to call heel. But I just thought this was a way, like, if this was to establish LAX's heels, I mean, they had a good reason for attacking the Lucha Brothers. It wasn't like the Lucha Brothers were, yeah, you know, it was the, provoked. Yeah, yeah. So that was just what I just didn't get it. But you know, once again, you know, when all else fails, we got to turn somebody heel. So you know, LAX has been, you know, the top of the food chain as far as the tag team division, and you know, people have said, I mean, and me especially, like they run through so many teams they can get stale quick so when all else fails now they turn heel so now we got to see what happened next but my i'm imagining this feud's going to continue oh yeah we will probably get another match <laughs> yep and like i said it took three matches for them to actually build up something between the two teams but i guess when you need to get distance out of a feud because like you had stated they haven't built anybody up this is what they have to do and by the time we get to that fourth match, is anybody really going to care? And I felt like that a little bit in this match because, you know, they even though there's some parts in here where it seems like I seen a lot of bit of a little bit of stalling. Everything's so like spot spot heavy. And, you know, a lot of times they kind of do some of the similar spots. I compare it to I remember I don't know if you've seen any of their matches, but when Bret Hart used to face uh, Mr. Perfect, mm -hmm. they used to have like a formula that they would do. And don't get me wrong. It was cool. But it was just like, oh, OK, I've seen this before. I kind of have an idea what they're going to do next. And this, in a, in a sense, is no different to me. So to kind of see a fourth match is like, you know, but I mean, obviously with the quote-unquote hill turn by LAX I mean mm -hmm. you know and you know my one thing that that kind of concerns me a little bit is some of these feuds they're going to try to drag out all the way till rebellion which is the end towards the end of April yeah, two months and, and that's a lot like I kind of hope what well, my hope would be that some of this stuff it could kind of end you know by mid towards the end of march and then coming into april we are at least towards the end of march we kind of get some fresh feuds you know going into rebellion mm -hmm. yeah because it could turn into the same tag title match and the same world title match yeah and you're talking about people paying what is it 49.99 i believe uh 39.99 Thirty nine ninety nine to see the same matches they've seen in January and hey, so might be okay with that, you know. There, <laughs> that's the thing, you know. With a lot of this stuff, even the things that we kind of point out and have our little bit of criticism, there's some that are fine with that, and that's okay. But I mean, I would like to believe, I would like to believe that you know the point of impact is they want to be able to appeal to almost you know everyone, not just a small group of people. Right. That is that is true. Uh, that is very true. Uh, but yeah, no, overall, I thought it was a good show. Uh, we still have five more episodes from the Las Vegas tapings, and then we go to Canada before we go to the Rebellion pay-per-view. So you have anything else you want to add? Um, not as far. I mean, great show. I don't know if you just wanted to touch on this real quick, but uh, we got the announcement about Explosion. Oh, yes, yes. Coming to Twitch. I believe it's going to stream Wednesday, right? Before the Behind the Lights show they do yeah and then i think the only thing the big thing they said there's obviously no 
uh, it's not going to be archived. So for those who can't catch it, you're going to have to catch it on the GWN, right. which, I mean, the way, I don't know how it's going to, be done i'm guessing the ones that we see on wednesday it'll be the same thing we see on monday i don't know yeah, it could unless, be vice versa <laughs> it unless could be they vice change versa. when it's going to be uploaded on the gwn so you if you want to watch it premiere you have to watch it through twitch and then it goes up right away afterward on the gwn i don't know but, but my, now oh, sorry go ahead no go ahead finish your point because it might no, tie into what i'm gonna say i was gonna say now if you really want to make explosion a better show this is the time to do it that's where i was going that's where i wanted you all right (laughs) yeah i uh i think now because it this can be your de facto second show like all they got to do they just got to tweak it a little bit you know this can be your opportunity to develop some talent and i think though i mean obviously now because it's going to start what it's going to start airing is it next week or when it wins the air date (laughs) that i am not sure I, i would assume it's next week Oh, okay, like what they're gonna have to do is now because explosions taped is usually the matches that are taped or that go on before um, the actual impact. You know, whatever they're gonna tape for TV. Mm-hmm. Like now, I really hope they put forth some type of effort and get some people on there that maybe we don't get to see on Impact a lot. And you know, build some people on there. Use that as a tool to build some talent. You know, you have some feuds or anything like that. I mean, for those of the you that are not familiar with Explosion, the format is it's usually one match. Okay, it's you know, I mean, the most randomness of random. Okay, mm-hmm. sometimes they even have some weeks they even have people who aren't even a part of the company or yep. haven't even been introduced. Then they have an around the ring, which I guess you can keep that. Then they have the GWN uh, uh, flashback or classic match right. and then they have a um a impact rewind i think if you remove the gwn classic match and replace it with a match or two give us three matches it's just an hour show give us three two to three matches mm-hmm. the around the ring and then the impact rewind then um that's that's solid right there I'm just trying to for all right so we had five matches in this two-hour show so that doesn't seem, you know, out of the realm of possibilities, the route they could go. And I know I brought this up weeks back of, you know, you could even put a Twitch title or something like that. Just make it so people will actually tune into the show. Give them a reason to. I think that would be Explosion would be tailor made if they wanted to bring another title. And I mean, it doesn't just have to stay on Explosion, obviously. Yeah. I mean, you could bring it, you know, the actual impact, but at least. You know, something can, you know, be there. Hell, you can even defend. I mean, I'm sure they wouldn't have the world champion on there. But, like, the X Division title matches. Like, that's if they want to position it as a second show. If they're going to leave Explosion as is, I mean... I mean, I think people eventually will probably just do what I do. Just watch the one match. Like, I've told Mm, you, you know... Yeah, Mm -hmm. just watch the one match and that's it. Yeah. No, that's... It's true. And we will see if they take the ball and run with it. Or, like you said... It'll just stay the same. That's it. All right. Anything else? Or you think we are good? You're good. All right, guys. Well, thank you for checking out our podcast. Ro, thanks again for joining me. We will see you guys next week. And as always, thanks for checking out our video. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Thanks, guys. Bye.